Hello and welcome back to lesson number five in this lecture series on CCNA4 with me, Joachim Shevrestad from the University of Skövde. And in this chapter, we will look into security and monitoring. Uh, so what we'll actually do from point to point is look at a little bit about local area network security and then we will look at SNMP and Cisco switch port analysis, uh, analyzer. Uh, so if we start with local area network security, what the material basically does is that it goes through some common layer 2 attacks and that is what we're going to do as well. And these are just yes, some of the attacks that can happen to a network and I decided to uh, to filter out and take those that I think is the most common. So the text that I want to talk a little bit about is CDP reconnaissance attack, uh, telnet attacks, MAC address table flooding attacks, and DHCP attacks. So CDP is the Cisco discovery protocol that is uh, that is used to, uh, that should be used by network devices to automatically share information about one another so that you know uh, what devices you have in your network. A very nice thing about it is that you can input a CDP a viewer uh, device into your network and basically automatically have a topology so you can keep track of all your devices. Uh, the problem with this is that you can connect a device to a network and just sniff for CDP data and uh, making, it, making it very possible for an attacker to make a reconnaissance attack where they basically use this protocol to draw their own topology of your network. Uh, the base, uh, the, basically the easiest way to mitigate this attack is by disabling CDP which you would do on Cisco devices with a command no CDP run. Uh, the other attack uh, that I want to tell you about is telnet attacks. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm putting this together, uh, all the different things you can do to telnet in one single blob. Uh, and essentially, you should know that using telnet for remote administration is inherently in insecure. It shouldn't happen in 2019 as it is now, so simply do not use telnet. The biggest problem with telnet is that it is a unencrypted protocol. So if you authenticate using telnet, you will send username and password in plain text over the network. Someone can do a man-in-the-middle attack and just find it and uh, then just use it to authenticate. So don't use telnet, use SSH instead. It's a proper protocol that is good for remote administration. Uh, one of my favorite attacks is the MAC address, flood, uh, MAC address table flooding attack and basically uh, the, this attack is possible because as you know a MAC address table that stores uh, the MAC addresses in network and the, uh, and the switch port where they are connected to, this, uh, this table is limited and what happens when it is full is that the uh, switch will start to flood incoming frames on all ports and uh, well if this happens it leads to performance decrease and can uh, and can make it possible for an attacker to sniff frames so basically a mac address table flooding attack is uh, that you fill up the mac address table uh, and then you cause the switch to have this flooding behavior and the way that you would do it is that you just make sure that you have access to the network and then you will use a script or something that sends frames with different MAC addresses and then quite quickly you will have filled up the MAC address table of, of the switch and then, um, and then performance will decrease in the network because everything will be flooded on all ports and also as an attacker you can start sniffing frames. And the way you would mitigate this is using port security so that you, for instance, ensure that, um, that you can't connect on too many MAC addresses on one port before it goes into a blocking state. And you can also just make sure that you shut down on used ports to minimize the risk of someone getting physical access to your network and so on and so forth. And then we have some cool DHCP attacks. So the first one is that you can configure a DHCP server on the network and uh, use it to hand client rogue IP configuration. So for instance, you can make all clients use a rogue DNS server that you control and then send, send clients to wrong uh, IP addresses uh, or to, to, wrong, to wrong destinations. So for instance, if you, uh, you want to do a, a nice fraud, you can set up a banking website that looks like a banking website, but that is in, uh, in fact fake. And then you make sure that when, whenever users try to go to the, that bank website, they go to your, uh, your criminal bank website instead, and maybe they will input uh, important information that you can have. Uh, another attack is that you just flood the network with the HCP requests uh, and thus you can drain all the available addresses uh, on the legitimate DHCP uh, server. Usually you may want to use those in, uh, two attacks in conjunction. So first you uh, drain all the available addresses on the real DHCP server and then you hand rogue IP configuration to the clients instead. And this is also something that you would mitigate using port security to ensure that 
the the rogue DHCP server can't enter the address uh, or the, the network. Uh, I also want to talk to you a little bit about some security best practices. So the first one and the one that I feel is the most important is to keep it simple. Uh, it's very uh, very easy to build a complicated network with different security measures here and there, uh, but instead just keep it simple, keep track of what you have, uh, try to keep it as as good uh, good and simple as possible follow the principle of least privilege so that you make sure that users and resources have the resources uh, or the permissions they need and nothing else that is perhaps the most essential in creating secure networks uh, also you want to keep stuff updated and use updated protocols for instance don't use telnet use ssh make sure that you apply security patches when they come uh, when they come around, um, as we've seen in the last years, uh, we we do have large breaches like Heartbleed. We had a Meltdown and Spectre. I guess we can assume that those big issues will come along. Uh, Cisco has had uh, has been targeted by attackers several times, and there's been uh, been weaknesses that's been uh, that's been visible and that's seen in Cisco products. Make sure you update with security pack, uh, patches when they arrive, and of course use good passwords, limit physical access to stuff, and uh, look into the material where there are a few other ideas as well. So I'm gonna leave security for for now. This is not a security course, uh, and instead we will go into SNMP. Uh, simple network management protocol if I'm not mistaken there is a lot of uh, abbreviations in this course um, and which maybe <laughs> it's hard to remember all of them but SNMP um, anyway is a management and monitoring protocol where the idea is that you can monitor devices and you can also do some uh, actions to them or make them do stuff from a centralized location uh, basically, in the net, when you have SNMP up and running, you have three different elements that you need to be aware about. The manager, the agents, and the management information base, or the MIB. Uh, the manager is the host that is used to manage or to collect information. Uh, the agents are the managed nodes, and the MIB uh, resides on the managed nodes and store information about those nodes. So the basic idea is that a manager can use get and set actions to get information from or set parameters on the managed nodes. Uh, also, the agents can be configured with a traps to forward information to the manager when some condition occurs. So we can look at this on a, on a picture inst uh, instead where we have an SNMP manager and some agents. Uh, the manager can use uh, get commands to uh, to fetch information from the nodes. It can use set to set some parameters, and or you can configure traps on the nodes to automatically send uh, information to the manager when something occurs. Uh, there are f uh, several different versions uh, and levels of SNMP with different levels of security. So in essence, we have SNMP version one up to three, um, and uh, if we look at SNMP version 1 and 2, uh, the level of those are no auth, no priv, which basically means that we don't have any real authentication or we don't have any encryption. Uh, in for as authentication in SNMP version 1 and version 2, uh, we just have a community string, and a community string is essentially uh, a shared string that every device need to know about, uh, but it's quite easy to figure out, uh, so it's quite easy to to, to be a member of the community, if you will. Uh, then in SNMP version 3, we have a username for authentication, so that is a little bit better. We still don't have any encryption though, so uh, a man in the middle attack would be able to read uh, most information, I guess. Um, then we can have uh, auth no priv in SNMP v3, uh, and then we have MD5 or SHA uh, in our authentication, or we can have the latest uh, or the most secure SNMP v3 that is called uh, AuthPriv. Uh, in the Cisco world, it requires us to have the cryptographic software image, but then we can have encryption with DES or AES, so that's a little bit better. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm just going to very briefly uh, take you to, through the step of configuring uh, SNMP version 4 uh, or to configure a Cisco device as an SNMP version 2 uh, agent. 
So what you would do then would be start by just uh, starting it up uh, with a community string. So you would use the command snmp server community string, uh, and string in this case would be some string that you decide uh, that you choose on, and then you can decide to have it as read only or read write de depending on what access level you choose. The second step is that you can document the location of the device using SNMP server location and some text. Uh, you can document the system contact using, S using SNMP server contact and then some text. Uh, if you want to, you can restrict SNMP access to only certain hosts, uh, SNMP server community, and then the community st uh, string and the Nexus control list is what's used for this. Uh, you can specify recipients uh, of trap operations. You do this with SNMP server host and then the host IP and the string. Uh, and finally, you can enable traps on the agent if you want to. And then you go SNMP server enable traps and then a notification type where you decide what traps to enable. So if you want a list of what traps you can enable, you go SNMP server enable traps and then use the question mark uh, and then type in whatever you want to enable. Uh, if you want to verify that SNMP is working as you, as you want to, you should use an SNMP viewer. There are some open source alternatives out there. You can install that on a computer, but you can also use show SNMP to see all configuration for SNMP or show SNMP community to see uh, the community information. So we will end with some span, uh, which is uh, uh, which is essentially a port mirroring feature. Uh, I. I just out of the blue forgot the actual name for it, so let's go. <laughs> uh, um, oops, and I removed the slides as well. So some span. Well, span is essentially a port mirroring feature. Uh, and when do you want to do port mirroring? Well, it's good when you want to do out of bands monitoring and package analysis. So essentially, the idea with span is that you can configure. Uh, can configure a switch so that whatever comes into one port is sent to its proper destination, but it's also mirrored to some other port. And then you would connect an IPS, intrusion prevention system, or IDS uh, to or packet anal analyzer to uh, to that port. And the idea here is that you collect. Uh, traffic and then you can analyze it uh, out of bands. So the idea here is that when we uh, have an IPS or IDS, what we can do is do deep package inspection. So we can actually look at the content of uh, of data, look for malware, look for different types of attacks and so on and so forth, or just analyze traffic to see what's going on on our network. This is quite resource intense. So maybe we don't want to switch a router or firewall to handle it because it would decrease performance. So then we can use span for port mirroring and we take it out some other port and we just do it out of bands. Uh, so there is some uh, terminology that we should be aware, uh, should be, uh, aware about when we talk about span. Uh, so first we have ingress traffic, which is basically the traffic that enters the switch. We have egress traffic, that is the traffic that leaves the switch. Uh, then we can have a source uh, source port or a source span port, and this is uh, a port that is monitoring using span. And destination span uh, span port is the port that monitors source port, uh, and this is usually where you have the analyzer IDS or IPS connected. Uh, you sometimes call this the monitor port. Basically, this is where traffic goes that is mirrored. Uh, you can also have a span session, which is the associ uh, association of a destination port with one or more source ports. Uh, and you can have a source uh, VLAN, which is uh, the VLAN that is monitored for traffic analysis. So how would you go about and configure this? Well, what you would do is that you begin with associating a span session with a source port, and then you do monitor session uh, number and source and select the interface or VLAN that you want to monitor. Uh, and then you have to associate it with a destination port. So again, you do monitor session, the same number, uh, destination and the output port. So uh, in the first case, the port that you want to monitor and in the second case, the port where you want to send it out. So that was actually it for this lesson. Uh, I didn't find any good packet tracer materials, so no demonstrations on this chapter. I hope you learned something. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comment field. Otherwise, see you next time for chapter number six. Thank you and goodbye.